Broadcasting to you on WNN 1470 AM, TrentoVision.tv, from the world's leading think tank laboratory, buried deep in an undisclosed building in hostile territory, where evil and corruption is exposed, you're about to enter the Tom Trento Show. No order, no order, all hands back in battle station. Trento heads United West, a group that says it defends Western civilization against the onslaught of Islam. Our guest tonight is Tom Trento. Mr. Trento has traveled extensively throughout the U.S. and Europe lecturing and exposing Islamic violence and infiltration in government, law enforcement, and academic institutions. He is one of the co-authors of Sharia, The Threat to America, and appears frequently on major media outlets and talk shows as an authority on Islamic ideology. He is the director of United West. Now, some of you may have seen him at the 9-11 uh, memorial ceremony. And there was a lot of misrepresentation there because they were saying people walked. I saw about three people who didn't applaud. The rest were all cheering all over the place for it. Um, the truth is, if you go back... And let me just do this for a moment. You know, having taught economics, I'm like to expand slightly. Um, back in 30, 1938, 39, there was a gentleman called Winston Churchill. And he was trying to warn his country of the cloud that was coming over Europe. And he stood before Parliament and he told them that. They booed him. They called him the old war horse. They laughed at him because we could negotiate with Germany. Germany really wasn't going to do anything. He was prime minister after Germany really hit them hard. And it's the voice in the wilderness that's trying to warn us, and that's Tom Trento. Tom? Appreciate uh, the opportunity to expand a little bit. You asked me to expand upon my controversial statements. You know the tip of the iceberg? We're going to touch. We're going to touch this evening the tip of the Mossberg, okay? We're just going to touch the tip of the mosque, Berg. And uh, our colleagues, some of the authors, Andy McCarthy, Admiral Ace Lyons, um, uh, Jim Woolsey, the former head of the, uh, the CIA, uh, Frank Gaffney, and the list goes on and on and on. Some of these folks brief on this subject matter. I'm going to give you about an hour, maybe a little more than that. Some of our folks brief two weeks on this. Every day, six hours a day, two weeks. So when a goofy little dopey uh, journalist comes along wherever we are somewhere in the country and, you know, critiques 10 minutes of whatever it is, this is the way the world works, folks. I mean, we don't, we don't expect them to know what they're doing, um, uh, particularly with the, the, uh, the intense academic necessity to understand this information and to respond to it. This takes years and years. I, I have three earned degrees and I've spent my life studying this stuff and dealing with it. But the issue is uh, the war on terror or is there a war on Islam or what the hell is going on? Everything centers in the West, in fact, in the world around our uh, commander in chief, our chief executive officer. Right now, enemies no longer fear us and friends no longer trust us. You can't. You can't construct a more seriously dangerous paradigm when you're dealing with the Islamic threat doctrine. It lives, it thrives on weakness. The Islamic mind, in fact, predating Islam, Islam came along at the end of the 7th century, the 600s. Predating that is the Arab mindset, which, which uh, constructed the world in, sim in two simple ways. Strong horse, weak horse. If the horse was strong, the Arab mindset said, don't screw with it. Don't mess with it. If the horse is weak, okay, we can kill it. That Arab mindset of a thousand years was energized by the Islamic doctrine that had an end state to it of paradise with virgins. So you take an Arab male who is functioned and, and, and geared toward uh, destroying the weak and then you stamp the approval of Allah on that and reward him with virgins in heaven, you have the perfect killing machine. Now, if my Muslim friends were here, and I invited some, I invited Hassan Shibli, 
who used to be a friend of mine until he went over to CARE, which is a terrorist organization. And I tell all my former Muslim friends, if you go to CARE, you become an enemy of the state and an enemy of Tom Trento, an ideological enemy. It's that simple. Hassan Shibli, I understand, was working his little scam with, uh, with the city of Venice. They do this all the time all over the country. When one of us speaks someplace, they go in, play the victim card, and try to get the administration in a particular municipality ultimately to do sensitivity training. CARE is a terrorist organization. They are Hamas. I'm going to establish evidence tonight to show that and prove that point. Um, so, but this president has put us in a position where the Islamic jihadis are gloating over the weak state that America is in right now. We could not be in a more dangerous situation. And when you negotiate with the brilliant negotiators in Iran, and they're brilliant people, these are not dummies, and you try to figure out how to suppress the nuclear capability, um, and you are doing it from a weakened position as we are, we will lose. I don't understand how we're going to be able to stop Iran from getting a, a nuclear bomb. The world will change overnight once they have it. Your gas prices are going to go up to $10 a gallon, and uh, eventually there will be nuclear ca catastrophic events worldwide because their eschatological system, their end-time systems, necessitates blowing up Israel in order for their Mahdi, their Messiah, to come back. We could make believe what I just said is a fairy tale. Or if you're the CIA, you're being briefed regularly on the eschatological end times theory and practice of the Ayatollahs and the Imams and the ICRG in Iran. Very serious stuff. This is the doctrine of Islam. When I talk this evening, and when I say Islam is the enemy, I am making those statements from the perspective of the experts in Islam, the scholars, the imams, the, the, uh, the sheikhs, uh, who have done all the work necessary to make pronouncements and proclamations about what they think and what they believe is going on. When they say Islam inherently is incompatible with democracy and democracy must be destroyed, you, we can say, oh, they don't really mean that. How could anybody mean that? Oh, no one would think that. And then they kill us. Or you could say, maybe they really mean that. Let's take a look at this. Uh, from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. Any Marines in here? To the shores of Tripoli. What year is the shores of Tripoli? Yeah, 1804, 1805. What happened there? Barbary pirates basically uh, occurred then. Did anybody see Captain Phillips, the story of the Maersk, Alabama? Great story. Um, if you're ever on the East Coast, go to Fort, uh, Fort Pierce. The SEAL Museum is there. And the, the lifeboat for the Maersk, Alabama is inside a building. They, spelt, they built a special garage for the Maersk, Alabama, that orange lifeboat. You got to go to the SEAL Museum in the state of Florida. Amazing. Fort Pierce. 1805, 1804, there was pirate activity. And um, finally... Uh, in 19, 1804, President Jefferson ordered the nation's tiny naval force to the Mediterranean to protect the expanding trade of the United States. And that's where he said this. He had this famous statement, millions for defense, but not one cent for tribute. The pirates were trying to uh, extort the Americans and said, hey, we got your ship, we got your men, give us some money. And uh, others were paying tribute. And Jefferson said, ain't happening. And as a result... Uh, to the shores of Tripoli became a rallying call for Americans, and that's where our Navy actually started, fighting Muslims. That's how the United States Navy started, and it's still doing that today, fighting Muslims in the Mediterranean, particularly off of Yemen and, and the Sudan and uh, out of Mogadishu. Uh, serious, serious problem. But this battle of Islamic Jihad against the United States goes way back. If you're at the Naval Academy at Annapolis, that is the first military memorial. First military memorial to be built. It's the memorial to the Battle of at Tripoli. The, uh, the effect of 9-11, September 11, 2001, was that all of us, about 500 of us, and some of you great people, were gathered at this monument 
in the town that so significantly played a role in 9-11, helping train the terrorists to fly aerial missiles to people that were sitting there, just went to their jobs, went to their desk, opened their computer, we're going to do some work. They had an evening date with their kids, pick them up from school, go home. Next thing you know, lunatics. But are they lunatics? Or are they intelligent individuals that were implementing a plan, a worldwide plan based in the religion of Hinduism? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, in Islam. Um, all religions are the same. It could be any religion. Um, so this monument there is, uh, is why we're here tonight. The essence of what I said was uh, the enemy, folks, the cause of why we are here today, September 11th, the cause is Islam. Uh, you know, you could, you could play games and say Islam had nothing to do with it, the system of Islam. Uh, it was radical people that knew nothing about Islam. It was the hijackers of Islam. It was a misunderstanding of Islam. You know, all of this, you can do that, but you do it to your own demise intellectually, academically, factually, historically. If you deal with the factual issues, the historical issues, the logical issues, the theological issues, the eschatological issues, you see a comprehensive plan coming together, and the individuals flying planes into lower Manhattan were simply the outworking of a tactic. The tactic is terrorism. The cause of the tactic is the system Islam. The individuals that participated were Muslims. And I'll make this distinction all the way through, that Islam is the animating system behind particular Muslims who commit acts of terror. Pretty simple deconstruction of the situation. And we had uh, you know, some uh, uh, junior cub reporters um, playing games, trying to write about something I knew. I think, I think Shelby's here tonight. And you know, we're not here to, I'm not here to beat up Shelby Webb, but uh, we already did. Um, the, we, we, you know, I'm pretty seasoned at this stuff. Somebody writes something that's not factual, they got to deal with us. It's very easy to write something, particularly in something in the heat of the moment, but when you've got to stand the test of truth, the, the test of facts, you start to crumble under that. Um, so in the future, folks who should, if they're going to write, they should do it from a, a, a knowledgeable base, a factual base, which is important. The response around the country was like 100 to 1, 100 positive letters and one negative letter because people know, they know me and they know my, my position. I, um, I, I am not indicting every single Muslim by any means. I have Muslim friends. I, 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 uh, I'm a Christian. I, I am mandated, but I choose to love people and to express that love. And I, my heart really goes out for for. Muslim men and women caught in the failed system of Islam. It fails as a religion. It fails as a political system. It fails as, a, as an intellectual system. But there's 5,000 religion, religions in the world. They can't all be right. That Satanism is a religion. Scientology is a religion. There's, I have no respect for these things. Academically, you, 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 you look at it and you go, okay, the, the thing you believe is nonsense. You're free to do it, particularly in this country. But my heart goes out for Muslims caught up in the failed uh, 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 slavery of Islam, particularly w women. And we do a lot of work to try to help Muslims get out of that system. America offers more freedom for Muslims than Sharia law or any doctrine in Islam. It's simply amazing. And I'm going to argue this evening that one of the things we need to do in fighting the Islamic Jihad is reach out to Muslim as individuals and, and love them and bring them into the American way. They're trapped in a tribal system where they may be able to go out and go to school, but they got to go home to the men in the family. And the men in the family rule with an iron fist, both men and women. We know this stuff very well. Why are Muslims coming to the United States of America besides those coming to propagate their doctrine. Many want to get away from the 56 Islamic nations that enslave them. It's a failed system, and I'll show you why. Is the United States of America at war? Yes, no, maybe. With whom? 
is the United States of America at war? The Nazis? The commies? Martians? Radicals? Extremists? Who the hell are we at war with? Somebody name the enemy. Martians, okay. Okay, Martians. Zombies, okay. Somebody name the enemy. You're going to say, well, we're at war with Muslims, we're at war with Islam, we're at war with jihadis. Um, and these words start getting thrown around, which, which is legitimate. You're trying to figure out who the heck we're at war with. Historically, in symmetrical, important word, in symmetrical wars, you got a uniform on. In asymmetrical wars, you don't have a uniform on. We're in a non-symmetrical war. The enemy doesn't wear a uniform. Therefore, how do we identify the enemy? Do you ever think of this? This is what we have to do. This is what the United States military, has. this is what the president has to do. If you get the identification of the enemy wrong, can you win the war? We're going to present tonight uh, evidence, um, uh, strands or, or avenues of evidence. Empirical evidence, historical evidence, theological evidence, political evidence, and military evidence to support the thesis that Islam the system of Islam is the enemy that we're fighting, the, the, uh, the ideological system that, um, that energizes individuals, the adherents of Islam or Muslims, to do acts of terror for the goal of defeating the infidel, the Jew, the Christian. That's the process. Um, let's just throw some evidence out. Empirically, uh, if you had to present something tangible that we're at war with Islamic jihadis, I'll make it easy, Islamic jihadis, how, what would you present as a, a piece of evidence? 9-11, I mean, it doesn't get more empirical than that. We all watched it. And how could we relate what occurred to Islam? There were 19 of them, 15 from Saudi Arabia. They were Muslims. That's sort of a clue, okay? Sort of a clue. The statements in the airplanes that we have, the, the writings that they had, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who's at Gitmo right now, planned it. Bin Laden, obviously, was, was behind it. So there's a lot of empirical evidence. Historically, as you'll see, uh, Islamic Jihad, Muslims attacking others, are part of their culture for 1,400 years. To deny that, you have to deny history. You have to look at this thing and say, oh, Mohammed took the, the love of Jesus and traveled across North Africa in 70 years and everybody converted. Well, you can say that, but the facts are recorded and it was a military campaign to subjugate the North Africans to Islam. Historically, Islam has been propagating jihads, holy wars, for 1,400 years. I'm going to show you five jihads, okay? Not one, not two, not three, not four, not, but five. Because you're going to have some nitwit on television tomorrow going, no, uh, Muslims historically just, it just grew because it's such a beautiful religion of peace. And because he has PhD after his name, people go, oh, oh, that must be what it is. Theologically, you look at their theology. I'm a theologian by training. I know more, I know more theological facts about Islam than most Muslims in the world do. You see, Islam says... Allah has spoken. There can be no questioning. There can be no critical analysis. Conversely, as a Christian or a Jew, you are told to critically analyze and seek and determine the truth. Not in Islam. Top down. To question the validity of the doctrines of Islam is to place yourself in perdition, in hell. Because inherently you have doubted Allah. Satan himself could not have constructed a more diabolical system. Politically, uh, we see there's 56 Islamic nations, 56. 57 is, is uh, Gaza now and the Palestinian Authority that received uh, uh, quasi-status by the UN last year. Um, the OIC, Organization of Islamic Cooperation, largest body of states in the world, 56 states together. They are called the Ummah, very important, Ummah, U-M-M-A, the family of Islam. There are no borders in Islam. Islam is borderless. It's ideological. No matter where you are, if one of you convert this evening to Islam, you are part of the Ummah. 
and the Ummah necessarily must function doctrinally as Islam has dictated. This is not open for discussion. This is the fact of the matter. Now, do people try to hide this? Yeah, because if you push this stuff in the United States, we're going to say, get the hell out of here. What are you, nuts? So if you say, oh, that's not really how we believe, look at militarily. We've got Syria going on right now. We've got Muslims fighting Muslims who turn around and fight other Muslims who turn around and fight other Muslims. This is a classic example of the failed system of Islam. Why are we, why, why is any Western country getting involved in Syria? Why don't we tell the OIC, 56 nations plus one, why don't we tell the Arab League, why don't we tell all the wonderful, brilliant Muslims in the world, go solve Syria. Don't even think about telling Tom Trento, you know, what he can and can't say when you can't stop your own stupid people from killing each other in Syria. Go handle that first before you speak to anybody else. What's important is to understand that, um, uh, the way we got to this situation, we, uh, we see Osama bin Laden here in his uh, religious splendor with the Arabic phrase behind that uh, the, there is no God but Allah. Um, and he was a religious leader. He was a sheikh. He had excelled at uh, the doctrinal understanding of Islam, which is why he was so highly respected. But he was also what? A military leader, just like Jesus Christ. Remember Jesus Christ had all those AKs next to him when he took pictures? This is Osama bin Laden in his Mohammed role. Mohammed, which is the goal of every Muslim male or female, to emulate each moment of Mohammed's life. Osama bin Laden was emulating the perfect Mohammed, the religious leader, the military leader, which is why he is still revered even to this day, what we've just interjected factually is that Islam at its beginning, at its core, is militaristic. It has a military doctrine for what purpose? Bin Laden in 1996 declared war on the United States of America. In uh, 1996, he, he wrote a paper, big fatwa, it's very long, and he laid out every step as to why... Uh, why um, he declared war on the United States of America, he gave Americans a chance to, to convert to Islam, which you have to do according to Islamic doctrine. Then he said, um, we're, if, you, if you don't do all these 10 steps, war, 1996. Then, uh, then in 1998, the World Islamic Front, second fatwa, religious ruling, issued that the World Islamic Front, uh, ja uh, February 1998, he, uh, they, they refined the fatwa to a jihad against Jews and crusaders. This is a holy war um, against Jews and Christians, listing the Americans, uh, the actions of the Americans that claim to conflict with God's order, Allah's order, stating that the, front, the front's ruling to kill Americans and their allies, all Americans now, this is 1998, two years after the first one, Civilians and military is an individual duty for every Muslim who can do it in any country which it's possible to do. Why do you think we have so many lone wolves and cells in the United States right now, Hezbollah and Hamas, ready to explode like in Boston, simply because he has given as a leader calling for a jihad if a 15, 18, 20-year-old kid dies in a jihad called by a sheikh, then you're guaranteed, guaranteed, transport to paradise with 72 virgins immediately. Fact check me on that, okay? If the fact check proves to be true, what the heck does that mean? What does that mean? If a 20-year-old can go online and learn how to build a bomb on Inspire magazine, like the kids did in Boston, Sarnev Brothers, and then blow up and kill six, eight people and wound 130. And the one brother is in heaven now with 72 virgins. Ain't a bad deal if it's true, which they believe. The National Commission on Terrorism basically said that um, these fatwas led to 9-11. I'm tracing the ideological connections between the doctrines of Islam and the terrorist acts committed by individuals called Muslims in the context of the religion Islam. Fatwa calls upon each individual of the existing Ummah 
each individual, 1.3 billion Muslims, in accordance with the words of Almighty God, fight the pagans all together as they fight you all together and fight them until there is no more tumult, tumult or oppression and they prevail in justice and faith in God. In 2004, we went to 1996, 1998, 2004, Iran declares war on the United States. They do that every week, but it really came out in 2004. And this is very shocking. In 2010, the Muslim Brotherhood declared war on the United States, and we took this very, very seriously. And uh, we said, uh-oh, there's going to be a problem. Once the Brotherhood declared war, you knew the Brotherhood was going to implement their plan that they've been putting together for 20, 30 years, and they went to Tunisia, and then they went to Egypt, and then they went to Libya, and then they went to all over the place. And it was the Arab Spring, and every leftist journalist, every goofy person on the face of the earth said, this is amazing. Oh, the, it's a renaissance for Muslims and the, the Middle East. And we're going, you got 1,400 years of doctrine to deal with here. This little bit of goof, fun stuff isn't going to override the doctrine of Islam, folks. And now we're prophets again when you see the whole Middle East falling apart. Um, Mohammed Morsi, who joined the Muslim Brotherhood while he was a student where? Mohammed Morsi went to Southern California in 70, uh, 78, did his degree there, became a Muslim brother there, had a couple of kids in the United States, went back to uh, Egypt, became the president of Egypt, and then um, through some interesting stuff, which is a whole nother brief, He's in jail now, and Iran has declared war against Israel and Jewish people. So these are formal declarations. I am showing you that the enemy out there has formally categorized declarations of war on the Sunni side. This is the Shia side now, Iran. Both on the Sunni side and the Shia side, formal declarations by authoritative people endorsed by authoritative entities have been presented to the West. This is a factual issue. So when I make a statement, Islam is the enemy, I'm pointing to this Islam as the Ummah declaring war. If, the, if I was teaching a class, a class, we got all these bits and strands of information. What is the unifying element of all this data? Islam. Islam is, now, we may not like to conclude that way. The unifying element is at its base Islam. Now, that makes you uncomfortable, then people try to nuance that. Well, it can't be Islam. Well, why can't it be? It just can't be Islam. Well, why? Well, it can't be. Well, why? Because it can't. It's a religion of peace. Oh, okay. Well, then you haven't persuaded me that it can't be. You got to do a little better than that. It's radical Islam. The radicals do that. Okay, let's take a look at the radical stuff. Take a look at that. What do we know? We know that there's Islam we're talking about, Muslims, jihad, Sharia, all these different elements. To win a war, now let's, let's figure out how to win this war. To win a war, you better not know the enemy, never offend the enemy, always assist the enemy, and then build a lot of memorial monuments to dead American soldiers and civilians. That's how you win a war. Well, let's go to Washington, D.C., to find out how to understand the threat doctrine of Islam and how to win this war that we're fighting. Because they should know something about that. This building's in Washington, D.C. You recognize it? This chart here, we, we entitled in the book, The Disappearing, um, the, the disappearing uh, Language of Terror. Look to the far right. On 9-11, when the 9-11 Commission came out, I think it was 2004, uh, all these words on the left, violent extreme, extremism, enemy, jihad, Muslim, Islam, takfir, brotherhood, all those. Then all of a sudden, in 2009, national intelligence strategy, all of a sudden these words of terror start disappearing from the federal lexicon. And, um, and enemies taken out, jihad is taken out, Muslim is taken out, Islam is taken out, absolutely excised took out the language of terror for federal agents trying to name the enemy. I just asked you to name the enemy with the metrics that we discussed. And now try being an FBI agent, a CIA agent, a DHS agent, a DEA agent, a lot of narco drugs, and not being able to say Muslim jihadis. Can't write that. Can't say that. Um, Muslim, can't say the Muslim Brotherhood. 
And look at the FBI counterterrorism lexicon, same exact thing. Somebody at some level said, we can't name the enemy, we can't use these terms. We wanted to know why, and we found out why. Here's why. Right now, these are the six main Muslim Brotherhood operatives that advise President Obama on a daily basis. These are vile individuals that are anti-American. They have been placed in these high levels by this administration. I mean, these guys are deeply involved. But I want to I draw attention for today. We can do briefs on each one of these, extensive briefs. I want to look at Imam Mohammed Majid, second from the right. We're going to look at him a little bit today. Uh, Mohammed uh, Majid, uh, born in the Sudan, his father was the Mufti of the Sudan, the top religious leader, um, and hardcore jihadi. He came here to go to school, like a lot of Muslims do, then became the imam in, in, uh, in Dulles, the uh, all-area Dulles network, uh, got involved with Dar al-Hijra, the mosque in Falls Church, which uh, Anwar al -Laki, was in, it's called the Jihad Mosque because it had a lot of jihadis. Anwar al was the American um, imam who was doing prayer services at the Capitol as he was managing the 9-11 terrorists at the same time. And uh, Anwar al finally took off and uh, a drone got him a few years ago out in, uh, in Yemen. But Mohammed Majid is a Muslim brother, hardcore, um, cultural jihadi, and um, he is deeply involved in, uh, in the, this administration. Now, when we try to understand what's going on, are we really at war with Islam, are we at war with Muslims, let's go to the scholars and ask them, Muslim scholars. Um, they have the answer. Muslim, a bunch of Muslim scholars put together a document hoping to help Americans understand how to address Muslims in the light of 9-11, in the light of Islamic Jihad, all of that. And the expert recommendation number one was respond to ideologies that exploit Islam without labeling all terrorist groups as a single enemy. They do not want the Ummah to come into focus. There's no global coordination. This is just individual stuff, sort of spontaneous Jihad syndrome. Number two, do not give the terrorists the legitimacy they seek. Okay. Now think this through. I can't go through too deeply all of these. But the terrorists seek legitimacy based upon what? The, their doctrine of Islam. They're animated by the doctrines of Islam. So the, their legitimacy is, they don't need legitimacy. They are legitimate in terms of acting out as fully believing, practicing Muslims. So these guys are saying, don't give them any legitimacy. Just make believe they're not even there. Proceed carefully before using Arabic and religious terminology. Um, now why? Because what happens continually is uh, a lot of these fatwas, a lot of the jihadis will speak in the Middle East in Arabic and then not have it translated for the United States. Uh, terminology to use, expert recommendation number four. Reference the cult-like aspects. Now, they're referring to individuals like Osama bin Laden, uh, Anwar al um, Ayman al-Zwahari, Yosef Kordari, Hassan al -Bana. These are the saints, the giants of Islam. These, these guys doing propaganda, these scholars, a group of scholars did this. They're saying, oh, this is, this is a cult. This is a small cult. It has nothing to do with Islam. Yosef Kordari, the most knowledgeable man on the face of the earth about Islam, he knows nothing about any of this. Um, while still conveying the magnitude of the threat. Oh, it's very serious, but, but it's just a kind of a cult thing. Uh, use mainstream, ordinary, and traditional in favor of moderate when describing broader Muslim populations. Trying to change the lexicon. Pay attention to the discourse on takfirism. Fearism, takfirism. takfirism is a doctrine, a very simple doctrine. Uh, it says that a Muslim can kill another Muslim if they deny the truth of the Quran or the teachings of uh, Muhammad. So if you're in war or anywhere and you say, Muhammad has said you need to fight, and they go, no, we don't need to fight, 
then they could implement the doctrine of takfir and they can kill that Muslim. Because Islam primarily is a governmental system. And you need everybody to stay in line on building the government, the caliphate. Um, emphasize, emphasize the positive. You know, oh, emphasize the positive is what's going on. We have interfaith meetings all over the country. That's positive. Emphasize the success of integration. Muslims are integrating wonderfully. Emphasize that. Emphasize the U.S. government's openness to religious and ethnic communities. Conclusion, words matter. They go on to say that uh, the threat is huge and um, we, we, these extremists, we can't make anything glamorous about them. Instead, the USG terminology should depict the terrorists as a dangerous cult. Obama, Osama is a dangerous cult leader. Uh, they have no honor, have no dignity. You can see what it says. This is, the, this is what a group of um, scholars have written to put together. And uh, they wrote this little paper, and they wanted to kind of get it out to help people see through their eyes. Well, they got it out all right. You know where they got it? Um, they got it right there. That is the document that is used by Department of Homeland Security to teach federal law enforcement agents how to address Islamic Jihad. These guys are good. They have taken Obama by storm, but they infiltrated President Bush too. That's uh, Abdul Rahman Alamudi doing 23 years in a federal penitentiary right now for trying to kill one of the princes in Saudi Arabia working with Muammar Gaddafi. And, uh, but he also was President Bush's right-hand man on Muslim affairs in the United States of America. Then a high-level Muslim Brother operative was influencing the Bush administration. Why do you think we got that asinine document from Islamic scholars as part and parcel of the Department of Homeland Security's methodology in dealing with Islamic Jihad? That's uh, Abdul Rahman al -Amudi. And uh, he doesn't, he's, he's, he's bipartisan. Uh, his job was to influence the United States of America. He embedded himself in the democratic system too. These are two Republicans. And we call these guys out all over the place. Grover Norquist, who's a hero on tax reform for the Republican Party. He is a devious, diabolical, Muslim Brotherhood operator in the United States of America. And we, we say that everywhere we go and we challenge him. And uh, he has hurt this country tremendously by bringing people like Alamudi and others into government placed as agents of influence. And Suhail Khan is his right hand man that we have busted open in, in different meetings and, and, uh, and videotaped him saying stuff that he regretted saying. But his parents were involved in starting the Muslim Brotherhood in the United States of America in, in, uh, uh, in Los Angeles as the Islamic Center of uh, Southern California. The umbrella organization for the various four, five, six hundred Muslim Brotherhood entities in the United States. It started back in 1963, that organization, and it's headed by, I'm going to show you in a second, none other than President Obama's number one Muslim advisor, Imam Mo Mohammed Majid. He runs a terrorist organization. That organization has contributed zero, zero to the United States of America. It is a cultural terrorist organization. It is a kinetic terrorist organization. Many real life terrorists have grew up in that and are in this. This is an operation for supremacist control of the United States flowing out of this. This guy right here funded that building that went up. He put up $21 million. His name is Yosef Nada. He built that building for them in 1983. Nice guy, except <laughs> he's the financier for the Muslim Brotherhood worldwide. Uh, he has been um, indicted by the United States as being a terrorist, and he's still fighting some of that. In 2001, there was a raid on his offices and a document was found called The Project. Now understand, he's the financier for the Muslim Brotherhood, a raid on his, uh, where his offices were. They found a book called The Project. Project was written in 1982. Uh, the document, though, it doesn't contain the words Muslim Brotherhood. 
It is the outline for the plan for Muslims to infiltrate and defeat the West and the United States. This was in the document found in Nada's house, Nada's the financier of ISNA. ISNA's headed up by President Obama's right-hand man, Imam Mohammed Maji. These were some of the writings in the, in the book. Networking and coordinating actions between like-minded Islamist organizations. Avoiding open alliances with known terrorist organizations to, and individuals to maintain the appearance of moderation. 1982, this is written, found in 1991. Evidence that ISNA and the Muslim Brotherhood and CARE are terrorists. That's where this information came out. Infiltrating and taking over existing Muslim organizations and realigning them towards the Brotherhood's collective goals. Using deception to mask the intended goals of Islamist actions as long as it does not conflict with Islamic law. Avoiding social conflicts with Westerners um, that might damage long-term ability to expand the Islamic power base in the West or provoke a backlash against Muslims. Establishing financial networks to fund the work of conversion in the West, including the support of full-time administrators and workers. Conducting surveillance, obtaining data, establishing collection and data storage capabilities. Spying on the West. Putting into place a watchdog system for monitoring Western media to warn Muslims of international plots fomented against them. Cultivating an Islamic intellectual community, including establishment of think tanks and advocacy groups to chronicle the history of Islamic movements. Developing a hundred year plan, balancing international objectives with local flexibility. Building extensive new, uh, networks of schools and, church, uh, schools and hospitals and all that. Involving ideological committed Muslims and democratically elected institutions on all levels in the West, including government, NGOs. This is an influence operation. I work with a lot of former CIA people. This is what they do in other countries. This is what's happening here by the Muslim Brotherhood. This is called subversion, and it's a violation of federal law to do this stuff. Instrumentally using existing Western institutions until they can be converted, put into the service of Islam. Drafting Islamic constitutions, laws, and policies. Avoiding conflict with Islamic movements on all levels. Inflaming violence and keeping Muslims living in the West in a jihad frame of mind. Supporting jihad movements across the... How the hell is this jihad word being used? You are dummies. Dummies. If anybody tells you jihad means anything other than a than a religious war to kill other people. These are the leaders articulating a militaristic doctrine. Supporting jihad movements across the Muslim world through preaching propaganda, personnel funding, technical and operational support. Making the Palestinian cause a global wedge issue. Dopey leftists buy into this for Muslims. They don't care about the Palestinians. Saudi Arabia can solve Gaza's problem tomorrow if they wanted to. They can build golden housing. They want that sort of fester. So the 15, 18, 19, 20-year-old frustrated Islamic kids, men, can fight and kill as directed by Osama bin Laden, Anwar al -Laki, and the others. Adopting the total liberation of Palestine from Israel and the creation of an Islamic state is a keystone in the plan for global Islamic domination instigating a constant campaign to incite hatred by Muslims against Jews. It's in their DNA. And rejecting any discussions of conciliation or coexistence with them. Their doctrine does not allow it. Actively creating jihad terrorist cells in Palestine. Linking the terrorist ac activities in Palestine with the global terror movement. Train them in Palestine, move them out operationally collecting sufficient funds to indefinitely perpetuate, perpetuate and support jihad around the world. This is evidence in a trial right about now. The Muslim jihadis and the useful idiots in the audience are saying, oh, Tom, this isn't the way it really is. This is like an aberration of Islam. Well, here's five historic periods of Islamic jihad conquest worldwide from 670 all the way up to 1922. This was the first, uh, the Safavid Empire. That was the smallest of the five. This was the next uh, smallest, um, the fourth largest in India, basically, covered all of that. These are, these are known historic conquests of Islam through the sword, establishing a state. 
Islam is both a state and partially a religion. The third, the Umayyad Caliphate in uh, 661 to 750, look, look at the area there, conquest it. The uh, Abbasid Caliphate, 750 to 1258. And then the big one was the Ottoman Empire that we're all more familiar with from 1300 to 1900. It's the easy way to, to know the 600 years. And they, they conquered that whole area in brown. And now the Islamic world is looking for the next establishment of the caliphate. So factually, I just presented historical evidence that Islamic jihad ain't just happening a couple of days ago. This is part and parcel of the doctrine of Islam, not the doctrine of radical Islam or of extremism. This is Islam qua, Islam as Islam. Oh, Tom, that's so long ago. What about moderate Islam today? Well, here's the Constitution of the Republic of Iran today, okay? And uh, if you look at it, it says the, um, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, yellow. Not only for guarding and preserving the frontiers of the country, but also, this is the Constitution of Iran, but also for fulfilling the ideological mission of jihad the mission of jihad in God's way, that is extending the sovereignty of God's law throughout the world. Give these freaks a, an atomic bomb, okay? Article 1 of the Iranian Constitution. The form of government of, of Iran is that of an Islamic Republic, not a radical Islamic Republic, an extreme, an Islamic Republic, endorsed by the people of Iran, of Iran on the basis of their long-standing belief. In the, I didn't make this up. This is their constitution. State goals, uh, uh, the expansion and strengthening of the Islamic Brotherhood, foreign policy of the country on the basis of his Islamic criteria. This is uh, the current prime minister of Turkey, our friend. Turkey's our friend. He said, uh, uh, Prime Minister Erdogan, he said, the mosques are our barracks, the domes are the domes of the minarets up there, the domes are helmets, the minarets our bayonets, and the faithful our soldiers. Islam is a religion of peace. Tell Turkey, tell the prime minister of Turkey, Istanbul was in Turkey. Istanbul was the center of the Ottoman Empire for 600 years. He has some sense of history that dopey journalists don't have and that PhD leftists refuse to look at. He's saying Islam has a militaristic component from which it goes out, delivering Allah's word for conquest, because that's what we are, folks. Deal with it. Yosef Quaradari, the head of the Muslim Brotherhood, he was exiled to Paris, recently went back when Morsi became president, in Egypt now still, and um, he said the mosque at the time of the prophet was his propagation center, the headquarters of the state, it was for his successors. The mosque was their base for all activities, political as well as non-political. As Muslims, politics is part of our religion, for it is doctrine and worship, a system for the whole of life, and the mission of the mosque is required by correct Islam is not in isolation from politics. The leading thinker on the Sunni side of Islam, 85% of 1.3 billion Muslims today, states this as the doctrine of Islam. So Chris Matthews on NBC, who says, oh, that's not true, he knows what he's talking about. The mosque then must have a role in guiding the nation and informing her about the critical issues. From ancient time, the mosque had a role in jihad for the sake of, a, of Allah. There's 2,200 mosques in America. There were only 1,000 when 9-11 hit. The Saudis had a building campaign, built another 1,200 since 9-11. 85% of those are funded by the Saudis. 85% are practicing, by doctrine, sub subversion in their mosques. Factually, we have the evidence. When you look at a mosque today, it's not a synagogue, it's not a church. It's a military base of operations. For the sake of time, I'll just go through it. Hamas, their charter says that they're one of the wings of the Muslim Brotherhood, and they will exist until they obliterate Israel. Uh, Saudi Arabia Constitution, if we go through that, same sort of thing, Saudi Arabia. Now, when you talk to Muslims and you point to Saudi Arabia, uh, Saudi Arabia as the keeper of the two holy cities, Mecca and Medina, and the Hajj and all of that, and you go, that's the perfect articulation of Islam, the Saudis. We know what kind of system it is. It is the perfect articulation of Islam. 
But it's so offensive that everybody has to make excuses. It's time, ladies and gentlemen, we don't make excuses for Muslims about their belief system. They got to live what, what, what religion they've chosen to believe in, good, bad, or indifferent. And I haven't seen any indifferent or any good. Back to the Muslim brothers. How are we in this situation? We, these guys have the ear of the president, and they're singing a sweet song of, of simple Islam to them and beautiful Islam. An Islam that is not Islam. It's something other than Islam. This is Mohammed, Imam Mohammed Majid. That's the president with Imam Mohammed Majid. That's the president with Mohammed Majid and you know, some other friends at one of the events. That's the president with who? Uma Abedin. That's, uh, look, present, future, question mark, you know, future, question mark, that could be a problem. The Muslim Brotherhood Memorandum was written in 1991, discovered in 2004. Another raid on a Muslim's house in, uh, in Virginia. A cop is at the Chesapeake Bay Bridge, a big bridge. <laughs> you, know, you don't have to be too sharp to notice this, but there's, <laughs> there's a, two people at the base of the bridge. A woman is in complete niqab, just a whole Muslim clothes, and they're taking pictures of the structure of the bridge. The state trooper goes, uh, I don't know about this. So he goes to have a little talk with them. Turns out that um, El, El Barasi, Mohammed El Barasi is his name. He's, he's, uh, there's a warrant for him out of Chicago. So they pull him in, and the FBI says, we want to take a look at this, this guy. They go into his house in um, Annandale, Virginia, 2004, not too long ago. And uh, they go in his basement, start knocking around. FBI's tricky. They find a sub-basement in Annandale, Virginia, 2004, going to sub-basement, over 10,000 documents. The archives of the Muslim Brotherhood in the United States of America found 2004 in Annandale, Virginia. They became the basis for this suit against all these Muslim groups like CARE, which are terrorist organizations. I'll show you that. The FBI and, and the law enforcement agencies submitted a small portion of these documents. There's tons of them. This administration is letting them ice. They don't want to do anything with them because the advisors to the president on all things Muslim, President Obama, if you want to have good relations with Muslims, we can't be prosecuting Muslims. It's not going to work. Now listen what was found in the Muslim Brotherhood 18-page document. The project was 12 pages. I showed you two pages of 12. I'm showing you one paragraph of 18. The exact detailed plans for taking over the United States of America are in both documents. If you read that, you go, wow, these people are serious. And one was written in 82, one was written in um, 91. And you go, they've been doing this for 30 years. They're successful. They are moving. They have a 100-year plan. The process of settlement is a civilization jihadist process. With all the word means, the Ikhwan, the Muslim Brotherhood, must understand that their work in America is a kind of grand jihad in eliminating peacefully and destroying peacefully the Western civilization from within and sabotaging its miserable house by their hands, your hands, and the hands of the believers so that it is eliminated and God's religion, Islam, is made victorious over all religions. This is the unindicted co-conspirators, a list of the unindicted co-conspirators, the, uh, the handful that came out of the Holy Land Foundation trial where five were found guilty, five people, and it was very simple. Muslims all over America were raising money to, to help Muslim orphans and Muslim hospitals, and the money was being funneled in Richardson, Texas, to the Holy Land Foundation. So, you know, wherever mosques were, the money got sent to Texas. And that money was then sent to help little kids in orphan orphanages and, and clean water and all that. Except the money went to buy rockets and missiles for Palestinians to kill Jews. It was funding Hamas to kill Jews. And Mark was involved in busting one of these guys a couple of years ago worked with the FBI and got a, a member of parliament, <laughs> George Galloway, member of British parliament, deported from the United States because of the, the footage that uh, Mark uh, videotaped in an Orlando mosque of them raising money for Hamas. So this is just a couple of names of, um, those are the people there, 
that were, uh, five of them were locked up. They're doing for uh, 15 to 60 years. Then there's just a few more names. 330 people and organizations. Unindicted co-conspirators being, wa not really being watched by this administration. And um, one of the organizations is the Islamic Society of North America, ISNA, that is run by him. Remember where, where he lives in the White House? He heads an organization that is viewed as a connection to terrorism funding Hamas to kill Jews. He's the head of it. In what sane world should he not be in jail or certainly not hold the position of counselor to the President of the United States? On its face, on the facts. This guy, I invited my friend Hassan Shibley here tonight. Hassan, you here? He heads up care for the state of Florida. He was just awarded Chapter of the Year by Nihad Awad, a cultural terrorist, a terrorist supporter. He heads up Care National. So Florida is the best care chapter in the country. <sighs> Give yourselves a hand. Hassan, lovely guy, lawyer, all of that, very sweet, very deferential, very smart. He is a terrorist. He, he supports terrorism. He says he doesn't, all of that. But his organization does. He's connected with his organization. He heads his organization. He lives and breathes with these people. He cannot exonerate himself from the dirt that's all around him by putting on a nice hat and talking very sweetly. So he's a dangerous individual for the state of Florida. And a federal judge, because CARE tried to get their name removed from this unindicted co-conspirator status. They went to court. They spent a lot of money. And the judge said, no way. You are Hamas. The best way to understand CARE today, Council on American Islamic Relations, CARE is Hamas. Yesterday, the White House ordered John Kerry to support the Muslim Brotherhood. He got in a big fight with Susan Rice, National Security Advisor to the President, because he chose not to. Now, I have nothing good to say about uh, John Kerry dealing with all this stuff, but he, 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 he went against the administration. They said, we want you to go to Egypt, and we want you to, to, to rip a new one, General Assisi, and tell him to bring the Brotherhood back into the fold and all of that. He said, I'm not doing it. There's no way. I'm giving you the tip of the Mossberg. Islam is a system incompatible with the U.S. Constitution by the declarations of Muslims. Any system must be critiqued and condemned if it's seditious. A Muslim is a human being who actually has more value under American law than Sharia law. Every human being should be respected until such time they become an enemy of America. To the degree a, mu a Muslim publicly and behaviorally, they can believe anything they want. Once they behave in a particular way um, and reject Islamic law, Sharia, it's to that degree, if they reject it, they're a good American. Conversely, to the degree a Muslim publicly and behaviorally accepts Islamic law and the jihad, they're a danger to America. It's quid pro quo. The Nazi system, once operational, was a threat to America, indeed an enemy of America, though we didn't hate every German. In the same way, the system of Islam, once operational, is a threat to America, indeed an enemy of America. If people want to just believe Islam and never do anything about it, fine. Who cares? But that's not Islam. You have to be operational. That's the problem. Look at 1,400 years I just showed you. The main operational component of Islam is the Sharia. Islam is a failed system personally, politically, and religiously. Americans should reach out to help Muslims caught up in this deadly system. Americans must stand against the cultural jihad that's more insidious than the kinetic, the fighting jihad. Get your voice involved in American politics. We love this country, great country, and be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Hey, have a good evening. <laughs>